Welcome to the Open to Hope Show. I'm your host, Dr. Gloria Horsley, with my daughter and co-host. Dr. Heidi Horsley. Well, today we have a very special treat for you. We not only have an amazing topic and two fantastic guests, but we also have another co-host today, and that is our good friend, Alan Peterson, the Executive Director of the Compassionate Friends. Hi, Alan. Hey, How Alan. are you, ladies? I am honored to be I, your third wheel, your wingman, whatever it is you need today. <laughs> the wind beneath our wings, Alan. The wind beneath your wings. I will start blowing right now. We but, love it. We but, love it when you co-host. Well, we have good energy together in the webinars and uh, television programs that we do, but our guests truly make the program. They do. Because their stories are real and, uh, and there's a, so much good that comes out of it. So I'm just glad to be here yeah. and work with both of you as always. And so we're thanks. also happy that we, that we can bring you this show from the Open to Hope Foundation in partnership with the Compassionate Friends. Well, Heidi, our topic today, I've really been interested over time in how our past experiences mm -hmm. impact and inform our grief. Because people grieve differently depending on their experiences and what has happened to them and personality types and all sorts of things. So we've got a couple of people today who have had a loss. Both of them have lost a child. And strangely enough, both of them lost children around the same age and in similar uh, situations where they fell and uh, died uh, as a result of a fall. Wow. So, and with teenage sons. So Heidi, you want to introduce our guests? Sure. We're going to talk to two people today, Mom. Uh, Richard Wood and Dr. Nisha Zenoff. And you know Richard. Mm -hmm. He's in my Burlingame chapter of Compassionate mm -hmm. Friends. Yep, you know him from through the Compassionate Friends. And Dr. Nisha Zenoff is a psychotherapist and a grief counselor. And she wrote a book called The Unspeakable Loss, How Do You Live After a Child Dies? And that's a lot about what we're going to talk about today. Yep. And the book is amazing. Well, Richard, welcome to the show today. Thank you very much. I'm very glad to be here. Welcome. Great. Thank you. And Nisha, welcome to you. Thank you so much. It's an honor. Well, Richard, let's start with you. Tell us a little bit about your son, Spencer. Spencer was 22 um, in July of 2006. He was uh, going to school in San Luis Obispo, and he was out at Avila Beach, uh, which is right out in the ocean. And he had been out with his friends. He'd had a, one of the greatest days of his life. Um, late that evening, he had missed a ride back into town, so he's walking over to a friend's house. And Avila Beach is like a small hamlet. There are no street lights. That night there was no marine, there was a marine layer, so there was no sunlight, so he was walking in darkness. He literally missed where he was supposed to turn and tripped and fell down a small embankment, wow. which normally they even reenacted it three times because they couldn't accept that someone died. But he fell down the bottom and was a, there was a concrete drainage ditch, and he hit his head just oh. exactly in the wrong place and had wow. a subdural hematoma. Wow, wow, so, wow. So sorry. Nisha, why don't you tell us about your son also? Um, my son, Victor died in 1980 and he was a week before he was 18 he was hiking in Yosemite and he was running in the switchback on lower Yosemite Fall and he tripped and he fell 700 feet Wow and I know you chronicle uh, some of that in your fabulous book and your your book is fantastic I, Thank you I so really much. it's a really amazing book and um, wh uh, we're going to talk a little bit about your book a little more in a minute but one of the things that I was interested in both of you is, Richard, you were telling me that you had been in a 12-step program prior to Spencer's death. And I know from being in a Compassionate Friends chapter with you that you're very, I want to say, wise. And um, there are a lot of things that, that I think uh, come up that remind me of some of the 12-step things. So I want to talk to you a little bit about how you felt like it impacted it. And then I want to I come to you and talk to you about being a therapist prior mm -hmm. to your son's death, because I was also, and I think there are a whole bunch of issues. So the idea is, how does your past life impact you? And you might, uh, the audience might want to be thinking about themselves and their past life. So talk a little bit about yours, Richard, and, and about 
the well, things you learned and have learned. The 12 step program is a, is a program of recovery and just like is in, in Compassionate Friends, when we lose a child, the commonalities are you begin at a point of utter desperation. And through the 12 step program, you, you, what I like to call is you release the golden, or not the golden, you release the chains off of your heart. And by mm -hmm. getting those chains off of your heart, you're able to get to a point where you, know, you get to gratitude, you get to hope. And mm -hmm. it's, a, it's, a, it's, it's an amazing process. I think many people, in fact, most people in the whole world could work the 12 step program mm -hmm. uh, to benefit themselves. Um, I like that gratitude, Heidi, because we know something about that, don't we? Absolutely. Right. It is the fastest way to shift your energy and to feel better. Mm -hmm. so, and, and, and it is hard to find gratitude initially, but if you can just find it in small ways. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so the gratitude is a big But I agree with Richard when he says anyone can benefit from 12 Step. I mean, the idea of knowing what we can control in life is so key, and there's so many things in 12 Step that are just, that can be applied anywhere. What I, what I like to say, Ed, what I've come up with through my journey is that I call grief the golden yardstick of love because nowhere else in our lives are we ever confronted with measuring the massive depths and the beauty and the, 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 just the whole enormous, the enormity of our love mm -hmm. for our children especially, yeah. but for anyone. Um, and, and through that process, I call it the golden yardstick of love because uh, when you to, to begin the journey of hope, the golden component is when we begin, we're able to begin measuring the love of our children back to us. Mm -hmm. Because love is the most powerful energy in the world. It does not die. It's there. Our children's love for us is there. And when you can begin measuring that hope from them coming to you, you, can, you begin that process of getting towards hope. Because for so many people in our program, you don't even want to say the word hope when, they're, when it's their first mm -hmm. time in a meeting. Right. Because they'll just, they will get so angry. But anger is one of those things, that's one of those chains on your heart and you've got to get those those chains off of your heart and when you do that you can you you can really you get to a certain component where you begin to see things and feel things better I, as a friend of mine once said to me um, to to feel the love of your child how do I do that and how do we do that think of love as air love is everywhere it's all around us we can't right. see it mm -hmm. but we breathe it and we breathe it with our lungs and our lungs wrap our heart so if you think of your child's love as air, close your eyes, take in that breath. Mm -hmm. That's my child's love. Let it out. Do that four or five times. You feel their love. Mm -hmm. Something happens, and that is hope, mm -hmm. and that is that feeling. Now, do you feel that your 12-step program helped you to cope with the loss? Absolutely. It absolutely did. Yeah. And I'm not saying that as a, we don't, I'm not a proponent of it, but it's that, again, it's, it's getting those chains off your heart so you can get that spiritual connection whether it's with your higher power or with your child, but to get that connection back. For me, uh, my journey when Spence died, we had multiple um, services for him because of geography back in, down in Newport Beach and Kansas City and so forth. And uh, I was amazed how much and how strong my spiritual connection was immediately. Mm -hmm. I mean, mm -hmm. I, I don't mean to sound so religious, but I felt God's arms wrap around me mm -hmm. and wrap around our family. Uh, and now, did you did you have to struggle with feeling that God spirit way back? So you re-recognized that when Spence died, did you have other losses that caused you to you know, or other struggles, or do you think it just came um, to you then? Nothing is you know is as profound as the loss of Spence. Um, in the following years, I lost both my parents, and that was it was you know, there's not you can't compare that. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, I, as a child, I've always had religion in my life. I think it kind of went away, like most people, as they get to college and so forth. But it was always there. But I was amazed, partly because of, of the spiritual work we do in the 12-step program, yeah. that it was right there for me. Okay. And, you know, and so many times in this program, we talk to people, and they'll say, you know, I'm so, if, if they want to talk about God at all, they're very angry. Mm -hmm. And I like to say, well, you know what God says? Welcome to the party. <laughs> I have very big shoulders. <laughs> I, you know, I can listen. Let's let's begin the conversation. Yeah. So, so leaning on a power bigger than yourself was an important part of the healing process. And for you, it was God. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Absolutely. And knowing yeah. you're not alone in it, because there is a, an entity bigger than yourself walking with you in this journey. I will tell you. You know, obviously, between us, we've met tens of thousands of yeah. bereaved parents, grandparents, and siblings. And I've had other people tell me that the experience of a 12-step program had helped them as well. And in 
because you think about it as we go through grief early on you can't think about hope but like mm -hmm. you say you you can lean on hope maybe you can even have hope that there is hope mm -hmm. but it is uh, there are some similarities uh, to that and uh, I think when we try to put grief in these little stages and uh, you know that we it just doesn't apply so I think it is very um, applicable mm -hmm. I really do and I will tell you that People, you know, say, well, when you lose a child in your family or whatever, you know, that a lot of people lose their relationship with God or with their faith. But I'll tell you what, I've met many, many people who found their connection mm -hmm. going or, through this or process. Or who are willing to get back to it. Absolutely. I always say to people, don't be afraid to go back and look at the, the religion of your childhood or whatever. Nisha, I wanted to ask you now, when my son was killed, I was a therapist. Mm -hmm. And talk about that. Was that a, did that is your past life as a therapist? How did that change? Was it easier to have a loss because you had all this information? Or no. <laughs> <laughs> Even though I was already a grief therapist and a psychotherapist for years, when Victor died, I found nothing that I knew intellectually mm -hmm. about psychology or working with other people helped me with my excruciating pain and grief. And uh, I made a vow at that time that if I could understand how parents survive the death of a child, because literally I did not think I could survive. Mm -hmm. How does one live after a child dies? It's yeah. impossible. And um, I promised that I would help find the answer and then help spread it to other people. But we hadn't met before tonight. Mm -hmm. and. Just talking about the 12 steps, I want to just bring in that I'm also part of the 12 step community. Mm. And what Heidi said earlier about gratitude, mm -hmm. and people say, Well, how do you live after a child dies? And I say, One step at a time, mm -hmm. one day at a time, yes. sometimes 15 minutes at a time, or five minutes at a time. Mm -hmm. And certainly, w the serenity prayer, which mm -hmm. most of us know or are familiar with it help when Victor died, and at that time I was not in the 12-step community, uh, but I knew the serenity prayer, and at that time and I would say the serenity, serenity yeah. prayer for those who you don't want to say it together? Sure. Okay. God, God grant, grant me, the me the serenity to accept, to accept the things, the things I, cannot I cannot change, change the courage to change the things I can, and, and the, the wisdom, wisdom to know the difference. Yeah, it's yeah. powerful. And it's that. powerful and it's non-denominational, yeah. and God can be the God of your choosing. It can be anything that has some meaning to you. And the other thing that you said that was so touching when you talked about the golden yardstick, mm -hmm. I always love to say that love is the only thing that I have ever found that makes the unbearable bearable. Mm -hmm. And it can be the love from your child, which never dies. My love for my child has never died. And Victor, it'll be 37 years. Mm -hmm. I love him as if it were yesterday. Yeah. And um, so love definitely is, is what helps heal. So what I love about doing all the programs that we do together is because you meet so many different people who different things work for them, but there is a commonality mm -hmm. to that. And uh, you know, you, the, I love your thing about the, the, the yardstick and the, the thing about love too. And I think no matter for those watching where you are in grief, if you keep working and processing it, and even if you look for a gratitude for just that memory that you have, mm -hmm. you do move forward. The process does move forward for you, and, and the love is still there. And I think sometimes people who are deep in grief are afraid to let go of, like you say, that chain of that pain or anger, because they're afraid if they let go of a little of that pain, they're going to somehow let go of some of the love. And it yeah. takes some time working this to understand that you can let go of the pain without letting go of an ounce of the love. Exactly. But that takes time and it takes being around people who understand the loss. But I love both of your perspectives. They're very insightful. I, I wanted to hit on one word that I heard and which was anger. Yeah. And you know that is, I, I don't know if it's particularly guys too. Do you think that guys are more angry or? I didn't experience it. Um, my wife did, and mm. everybody, everybody, as you said earlier, the, you know, the journeys begin like two lines in outer space, your, your life and that child's life, and when those points cross, that's the beginning of your grief journey. And um, 
I don't know, because I had to deal with everything with Spencer and the way it happened, I didn't get caught up in anger. And I, a lot of people can, and you have to work through it. Uh, you can have resentments, um, guilt, you know, blame. Shame. Shame. Shame because um, you should have taken care of your child. So many people would say to me, how, Rich, how can you, would they understand Spencer's story, how can you feel responsible? I said, because I'm his dad. Mm -hmm. right. And our That's responsibility it. is to keep them alive. Right. Exactly. exactly. Right. And keep them yeah. safe. And keep yeah. them safe. Yeah. So. Drive safely. Yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. And the last words Victor said to me when I said, honey, be careful, is what we instinctively say to our children. And he said, go hiking up to uh, Yosemite. Okay, mom, don't worry. I don't want to die. Mm, wow. Wow. And so, yeah, I was plenty angry. I felt angry. I was also going through a divorce two years later. Mm -hmm. So I had a double set of grieving going on. Mm -hmm. But I thought, who or where in the world can hold my enormous anger? I was angry at God. Mm -hmm. And so I would go to the ocean mm -hmm. and I would go to the mountains mm -hmm. because I felt nature could hold my level of pain and grief and anger. And in the ocean, I would yell and scream, mm -hmm. and I would get a sore throat, but I'd feel better. <laughs> yeah. um, and I don't think there's a parent whose child has died that doesn't feel some, some guilt. Well, I remember when, and my mom knows this story, and I have not told it very much. After my brother died, and you know he died in a car accident with my cousin and, and in Washington, D.C., my mom wasn't with them, and my cousin was driving. And, but she called me on the phone to talk to me right after, after I'd found out. And she was crying really bad, and she apologized. And I'm, I've never lost a child. I've lost a brother. I didn't understand that. I said, but mom, you weren't there. She said, I know, but I should have kept him safe. So it was interesting from like, I, not understanding that. Now I'm a parent, so now I do understand it. But, but Heidi, um, you're talking about sibling grief right. at the Compassionate Friends Conference. Help me, after all these years, understand more deeply my two surviving children. Mm. And I really went back and apologized to them. Wow. And one thing you said, I don't remember if it was you or Gloria in the, yeah. in the conference when you said, you can say, I've lost a child, but I've never lost a sibling. Right. Mm -hmm. And that was so important to hear. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because they're different, they're different kinds of losses. Mm -hmm. But they're both very profound and powerful. And sometimes as siblings, we don't feel like we have the right to our grief because we've been told that yours is the worst loss that you can ever have. So sometimes we kind of are quiet and don't say that much about ours because mm -hmm. society is whispering in our ear, your parents have been through a lot, don't cause them any more pain. Mm -hmm. you know, th there's one thing I just <clears throat> would love to bring up. I was mentioning it quickly earlier, mm -hmm. is that I just got an email talking about um, the um, Pearl Harbor in 1941. Yeah. And it said, talked about a young man who died. And then it said in the article that his mother who, of course, was never the same, quote, after the child died. And two years later, the mother died, and it said, her grief took her to her grave. Wow. And I was reading it, and I started to cry, because I thought, we don't have to go to our graves mm -hmm. now when our children die, because we have compassionate friends. Right. Mm -hmm. We know we're not alone. We have open to hope. Mm -hmm. We don't have to walk alone. We have a community. We have other people, and we can talk about our grief with mm -hmm. each other and our love and our hope, it's a different time. Yeah. And I just, I felt so grateful, again, mm -hmm. for living in this time now where we're, we're miracles. Look at all of us. Yeah. Mm -hmm. This uh, is incredible. Yeah. I, I always stress, and I'm like a broken record if you watch the shows we do, but you know, I do a lot of interviews and reporters want to know the simple answer to how do you get through a loss like mm -hmm. this. And I tell people, one is educate yourself about grief just what you two said here today. I wish I could have heard that when Ashley first died. I wish I could have heard mm -hmm. what you said in the first five minutes of the show. But to educate yourself, to understand the grief process, because it is mental and physical and emotional and spiritual, mm -hmm. uh, but to have support. And if you, if you understand the process a little bit, and if you have that support, and so that you understand that when you take that step back, you're not doing something wrong or you're not crazy. It's crucial. And, and, and Gloria always says there can be post-traumatic growth. We see it all of Absolutely. the time. And there was a time not that many years ago 
we were, you know, using the word hope or finding joy again was almost like we need to be mm -hmm. careful. Right. But you can find joy again. You can find a quality of life again. You can find a life of great purpose and a deep meaning. And we see that every right. day, and you see that every day. I do. I, in my interviews in my book, I interviewed 72 bereaved parents, grandparents, siblings. It is amazing to hear how they've taken their grief and turned it into action mm -hmm. and how they have given themselves permission to love and be compassionate with other people. I mean, I remember you were saying about all the, the um, scholarships that you give out. Wow. So, Richard, you give scholarships out in your son's name? Yeah, we've given out 34 scholarships down wow. at San Luis Obispo in his name. Thank you. Wow. Yeah, it's incredible. That. We've had oh. 10 memorial concerts. Oh, I love and, it. You know, it's, I'm really very close to many of his friends still. Mm -hmm. This last year, I've been to three weddings mm -hmm. of his college friends. Wow. I got a phone call this week from one of his female best friends, and uh, she said, this is my second phone call to, to let, I told my parents that I'm expecting a baby and you're the next call. Wow, you know? that's And then she said, and guess what the due date is? Wow. So she said, you know, July 22nd, that's the day Spencer died. But, wow, my wow goodness. that's you know, amazing. But, but for us, that wasn't, that wasn't sad. That was yeah, just, it's just right. like one more well, and a, and element. Well, and life is coming into the world. Mm -hmm. yeah, absolutely, yeah. And, and Spencer yeah. was full of life. Absolutely. It's not that both yeah. your children were. I mean, they were very active and they engaged in life fully. So. Yeah. I'd like to take this time, if I can, to thank you two both and, and also Alan, but what you all do is amazing. Oh, well, it thank is. you. It is. Thank it you. really is. You know, it, it's interesting because it's been so many, and Scott died in 1983, and, mm -hmm. and people are sometimes, you know, I'm sure they wonder, you know, what are you still doing in this yes. field? But it is such a wonderful area to be in because post-traumatic growth, it mm -hmm. is so wonderful to see people go from, you know, really the depths of sorrow mm -hmm. and see them come and do service. And uh, it's just amazing, isn't it, Heidi? It is. I mean, people do say, well, how sad, how can you do that? And I said, it's the opposite of sad. Mm -hmm. right. To take, to meet people at their darkest moments and to walk with them out back into the light is the most rewarding and incredible thing you can ever do. It yeah. saves lives. Yeah. It's yes. not about death, it's about living. Absolutely. And about love. And, and honoring our loved ones through mm -hmm. living our best life. I like to say it's a gift from Spencer to me mm -hmm. to I help other it. people. Because it's what he would want me to do. I, I totally Absolutely. agree. I, I just... When I, when I think of the Compassionate Friends and as the executive director today, it's a great honor to be in that position. But I remember walking through that door the very first time a couple months after Ashley died. And I, when I think of our organization, I, I really think of it like we come walking in when everybody else is kind of walking mm -hmm. out. Those friends that can't handle it and family that can't handle it, people that are trying to make you, you know, push you to be better than you are. Uh, we walk in and, and we, we don't try to fix you, we validate you. You said something that's just so key, and I wish everybody understood it, but you were talking about all your training as a therapist and a counselor. You know, people think we can intellectualize this loss, mm -hmm. or some people think we can just spiritualize this loss, but we have to grieve this loss. Mm -hmm. And if more people, because we spend a lot of time, I think, in grief, uh, trying to read every book or learn everything, mm -hmm. but it's something you have to feel your way through and breathe your way through. Mm -hmm. You're so well, right. Alan, that's a great thing to close on, and we want to thank you guys for being on the show. It's amazing. Are you going to sing thank something you. for us, a Alan? Very request to sing a song, and I am going to do this song uh, specifically for you. Ah, thank you so tonight much. I light this tonight, candle. Tonight I hold this candle. Oh, thank you so much, right. right. Alan. Well, t again, thank you guys for being on the thank show. You. Thank you for very all the much, things that you, you do to help the people that are bereaved and make the world a better place. Well, thank you. Yes, and thank thanks, you thanks so everybody, much. for watching this show today. And Heidi and I always want to remind you, if you've lost hope, please lean on ours until you find your own. And God bless. Tonight I hold this candle In memory of you Hoping some way, somehow My love will shine through I close my eyes Lost in the glow 
There are so many things that I want you to know. This candle says I love you. This candle says I miss you. This candle is saying that I remember you. When I'm holding it toward heaven, it feels like you are near. If you're looking down tonight and see this candle burning bright, it says I'm wishing you were here in the glow of this candle. I can almost see your smile and it carries me away for a little while to another time another place when all it took to light up my world was your beautiful face. This candle says I love you. This candle says I miss you. This candle is saying that I remember you. When I'm holding it toward heaven, it feels like you are near. If you're looking down tonight and see this candle burning bright, it says I'm wishing you were here. Well, someday, some way I'll see you again and I'll hold you in my heart until then. This candle says I love you. This candle says I miss you. This candle is saying that I remember you.